Hey Noah. Hello. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for joining me here. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Um, yeah. Why don't we start at the beginning? What's the beginning? Oh wow. Okay. Um, so um, I was born in Northern California in um, 1969, and my uh, my f I was born in a redwood forest, um, in the middle of a hippie commune. Cool. Um, Can you it, describe what that was like? Uh, so, um, my mother was, uh, traveling around the country and, um, she ended up, she was like many young people were doing at that time. She ended up, um, me meeting somebody at uh, Mama Castle's house at the Mama's and Papa's actually. Right. And, um, uh, they ended up moving together. He had some, the, uh, the, the person she was with, uh, who's my biological father, sure. you know, um, he, uh, had, had some money and I bought a piece of land in Northern California and I settled and I started a little hippie commune that was, the idea was they're gonna live off the land and um, um, no electricity, they had a well for running water. Wow. Um, and um, a couple of years later, the, the community was not going exactly how they planned. It became more of less of a community and more of kind of a hangout for like music, people coming and jamming music and all kinds of drugs, and partying. Um, and, uh, there's a, there's a longer story behind, but we need a couple of hours, <laughs> but, but okay. anyway, the quick version is that, um, um, my mother and, um, my, my biological father, Bill, they split up and my mother ended up meeting, um, my father, Ben Sion, who was at the time was searching also ended up in this community and he joined the community also and, uh, built a little house out there and they ended up getting married. I uh, met my mom. And they had um, another that we had uh, my sister. And shortly after my sister, around the time my sister was born, my father has what he called a Yiddishkeit attack, where he decided one day that he wants to, uh, he was into Sufism and into other religion. And he decided he's going to explore Judaism. He didn't know anything about what to do as a Jew. But uh, he started, he sent for his dad in, in New York and said, send me my bar mitzvah and I want to start putting them on. Wow. And he would wrap them on every day and take them off. And that's all he knew. And then someone's, someone told him that if you really want to learn more, there's this, <clears throat> most rabbis probably won't see you and the way you look, you have long hair down in his back and he's like a total hippie. But there's this rabbi in San Francisco, Shlomo Karlbach, and if you, he's, 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 you know, it would be perfect, you should go meet him. So my dad got in a Studebaker truck and drove to uh, a couple of hours to San Francisco to the House of Love and Prayer. Uh, he met, he said, uh, the way he describes it is, uh, he said he had a list of questions he was going to ask the rabbi, you know, about Judaism. Mm -hmm. He said he walked in and he said literally one by one, the rabbi answered every one of his questions. Mm -hmm. I almost felt like he was talking right to him. And he met with him afterwards and had a long conversation with him. And, and uh, Shlomo saw that he was really uh, on fire. And he said, well, if you really want to learn, you know, this, you have to go to the source and go to Israel. And so um, a few weeks later, they packed everything they had. They decided they were going to go to Israel for one year and study. This was, was Shlomo my, living in Israel at that time? Shlomo was not living. He still had the hospital in prayer, but his plan was he was starting to really try to make the move, get everybody from us. Right. The hospital in prayer to start to move to Israel. There was no Moshav. There was no, mm. there was nothing yet. Um, it was just plans. But my dad went and um, <clears throat> they went, their plan was to go for a year and study. Um, they haven't left since, it's 50 years later. So uh, they moved to Mabaser Tzion, outside of Jerusalem, Rakaslita, and my dad uh, started going to, uh, he asked about, he wanted to go to Yeshiva, and he was recommended uh, Diaspora Yeshiva because that was the only place that would accept the guy. Like, he was a Hoser Machuva Yeshiva, and they accepted him, and he just jumped in head first, was learning day and night, and they started, uh, there was a couple of other musicians there, and they started the band, Diaspora Yeshiva band. Oh, wow. So him and Avram Rosenblum and uh, Shimmy Green and uh, Dahlia Goldstein and then a bunch of people that were there, they decided to start playing uh, together and they started writing and it just caught like fire. They were all great musicians and great writers and uh, in a very short time, they started getting a lot of popularity and they were doing it every Saturday night gig. Um, <clears throat> so this was my backdrop. I grew up with this. Um, so there's always music in your life. always music in my life from time. And not just that, my dad also was um, a, a bluegrass banjo player and fiddle player. And so he kind of instilled that kind of love in me from a young age, and he would have people coming over um, and playing bluegrass in the house. They would have regular jams. My my parents, for extra income, would actually play. My mom also plays a little guitar, and the two of them would go and play at a place called Pizza Barn in Jerusalem. They would take me along a lot of times. 
um, and they would play. Sometimes they would busk on the street. And I'm, one of my first memories in Israel is actually me walking around with the hat collecting money while they right. played. And uh, they but grabbed a huge crowd outside of Jaffa Gate, you know, to get a cruise crowd of people. And they were. Is that, do you have any like photos of that? I don't, sadly. Okay. Sadly, I don't even. They were so poor. They came there really. They was really a jump, a leap of faith. They came with no, with no, didn't speak a word of a word of Hebrew. Um, so I don't even know if they had a camera. You know, so right. <laughs> uh, there is some pictures in that time, but I don't. There's none of them busking, okay. sadly. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that was my first intro into music, and then a few years later. Um, we we heard uh, my parents heard that Shlomo actually has found a piece of land and he wants people to move. It was like in near near Lud. It was was plot of land. It's called Modine. And my parents were the first to jump on board with like two other families, and we moved to this desolate moshav that was like had like ten houses in it and nothing around for miles. You could hear a car coming from miles. Like mm. just silence. Um, not the Modine that we have now. Right. Uh, this was in seventy four seventy five I think. Um, and um, Sh- Shlomo started calling. He would spend um, throughout the year, a week here, a week there, it would make it a Shlomo Shabbos. It was a huge deal. People would descend. Another night, it was just completely quiet and desolate. Um, people started coming family by family. Eventually, it became 12 families, 13 families. Never really grew huge, but um, it was always uh, uh, had a, it was a special place because most of the people who came there were um, Shlomo Hasidim who came from. Yeah. from uh, hit these from San Francisco, from wherever. And uh, like I say, there was what running water electricity was iffy, it was something that was very, very much off the grid. And um, a lot of them played music. There was a lot of music there too. So I would spend, I would, uh, you know, my dad would travel to Jerusalem to play music with the Aspirin to learn, and then he would be on the Moshav and it'd be music there as well. So I was Did it learn. feel kind of like familiar to you? It was almost like an Israeli version of what you were. It was lyrics. so completely not familiar to me. No, it was oh, okay. new, it was its own thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the Moshe was a cocoon because it was like. What age were you? Sorry, when you? I was moved there. I was at this point. I was probably like six or seven years old. Okay. Um, I, uh, second grade. So yeah, seven years old. I think. Um, there was not a lot to do. I was the, also the only family. My parents were the only family really had older kids. I was the oldest. So the next kid after there, there was nobody had kids. Uh, my sister was three years younger and then everybody else was much younger or babies or not married yet. So it was really a startup. So I had a lot of time kind of on my own. I grew up very much. Uh, and of course, there's nothing else to do with you. But, and I love music anyway. I just always had a deep love of music. I was imagine myself being a musician, even though I Right. didn't really have any idea of how that works or anything. Um, and uh, I started picking up my parents, my dad's guitar. I started strumming from a young age. And um, and then um, when it came, to, I, I played all throughout like uh, high school as much as I could. Um, at, when I was younger, my parents sent me to a Chabad Yeshiva and they didn't allow for instruments. So I really wasn't allowed to play instrument at all. When I was about 14, um, uh, I did not like this issue. <laughs> like, no, why, why, no, why did they not want to? Why did they? It was just. Play? I hate to say it, but it was. Just, uh, it was a terrible school. It, okay. was, uh, it was a place. Um, I, I heard it's changed since. So I don't want to talk too bad. But it was a place in Lud. Um, it was just really, really hard on kids there. Um, and um, this place turned me off a lot. And my, I finally told my parents I can't go back. I'm just. It was. I'm, I was nine. And they sent me to a new yeshiva high school, which was the first of its kind. It's called Ma'araba, and it was started by Baruch Chait, uh, oh, wow. who wrote Kolo Olam Kulo, doesn't know that. Uh, phenomenal guy, and he, it was the complete opposite. He actually said, where's your guitar? You play guitar, and he encouraged me to bring the guitar, and Love one it. of my first gigs with him was, <clears throat> he took me, he said, I'm going to play in a prison around the thing, want to come play with me, and he took me to play in prison. I was like, one of my first gigs ever. Uh, so from that point on, I was really, uh, uh, really, able to like practice music and play and I just got, I just got the bug that hadn't stopped. And um, a few years later, I met uh, C. Lansbaum, the guitar player with me who had been sure. a while ago. Sure. Uh, I met him. He had also been brought to Israel from Shlomo and he was, he had, he had married a woman from the Moshe, uh, his first wife. So I met uh, him over there and we happened to play together at a Purim party, which is what we're doing this now. So it was actually at a Purim party. He saw me, he was like, uh, I was one of the kids of Moshav. And uh, we were all very enamored with him. He was a huge star in Israel. Right. He became very quickly the top 
player, so would he even paying attention to me? I was like, oh, and then he said, you have a great voice. He's like, you should want to record with me. And I uh, started going to a studio in Ranana, and it's a home studio, and we started recording together. Wow. And even started a little band there. And then, then the army... Was that in a sense? This was, was in oh, this pre in oh, a yeah. sense. I think it was called, we were called the Clubhouse Band. Okay. The main name. It was me, him, <laughs> and another uh, sax player from Israel Nitsan. And, and um, we did a few gigs, but then I told C, I said, well, it looks like I don't know what to do because the army is after me and I have to go to the mm -hmm. army. I was really not prepared for the army. I had grown up in Yeshiva, and then I'd left Yeshiva, and I was playing music, and um, I didn't, you know, really did not want to go to the army. So... <clears throat> I had uh, I had permission to leave the country for one gig doing France because uh, another long story, but I ended up using that permission to escape from the United right. States, and I knew that C was moving that Lansman was moving here shortly after. So um, he we met. He, I stayed here for a few months, and then he came and joined me, and we started a band called Incense. Wow. So they were playing in New York, and our concept was at first just to play. Rock and roll and be big stars. Okay. And we did that. We started, we played for American a year. Dream. <laughs> American Dream. Uh, worked in a restaurant in the day and played, you know, played at nights. We played much as we could. Uh, we got signed about a year later to a record company. And the first thing they said was, you guys got to sing a song. You, it's, you, your backstory is very interesting. Oh, wow. And not Jewish or anything, but he's You like, probably thought you had to do that. And we were like, right. we fought in first. And he's like, yeah, I thought I was like, we should hide that, you know. Sure. Yeah. And he's like, no, that's what's interesting. It's a million rock bands. You guys have a backstory. So we did. We said, we put on um, Oz Vahadar was, was the first oh, song. Oh, wow. And, okay. uh, wow. And he was right. It opened up a whole new uh, avenue for us where suddenly uh, it was a way to reconnect with Israel again, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Suddenly, all these yeshiva kids started coming out to our shows, which was pretty weird. We were playing clubs. We were playing Wetlands at the time, Tehran, and all these clubs downtown. And uh, we always yeshiva kids started coming to our shows. What, like, what age were you when you when you? Uh, I was nineteen. 19. Yeah. Before, before you continue, yeah. how, what what was that like? Like the I guess the experience of flying to France for a gig and then. Disappearing. <clears throat> Does it, do you have problems going back to Israel now still? Or? Yes. Okay, wow. <laughs> and, and many years later, I don't and anymore. I, I, finally, I, finally got, I got a oh, okay. I finally got a tour. Um, so, but for many years, I was very scared to go. So I have dual citizenship, sure. and I was able to just return. I'm American, and I got away with that okay. somehow uh, for many years. Um, um, I've always found it very difficult, that whole idea that, like, I don't know, so I, I also I understand the idea of an army and people having to go, but also... Like some people aren't cut out for that, and you know, people ask me when I, I was definitely not cut out. I was also because of my background. I grew up in Shiva, none of my friends were going, so I did not know anybody right. with the army. None of the most shy to the army. And so you just really, and like, I was yeah. playing music at night. I was, I was really, right. it was, uh, it was like the last thing in my, my mind I wanted to do. I was really scared to the army. Right. Um, yeah. um, crazy though, <laughs> this just let me go back but, uh, many years forward. Um, my daughter just graduated high school and. Ran back and joined the party. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like that always you, happens. You gotta, you gotta, yeah, you got to take the reaper. Yeah. yeah. So. Were, you know, my dad's, a, my dad's a rabbi. And we were all like, all the kids were like, yeah, we're not doing that. I'm just waiting for my kid to be like, well, I'm yeah. going to be a rabbi. Right. Yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, you were about. So, her, so she's in the army now. Okay. So, sorry. So back to, yeah. to. So, anyway, and so and back to the, so out. I said, yeah, so we started, did that for a bunch of years. Uh, it, I remember it, <laughs> that, uh, I don't forget what she was, but the rabbi said, do not go to soul farm in a sense, in a sense, I'm not going to a sense shows. You know, it's, uh, it's not Jewish music and next gig we had three times as many. That's what happens. <laughs> so that was the best publicity we could have gotten. Did you pay the rabbi to do uh, that? I should have, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and it, it, it's, we really, I felt, we all of a sudden realized that there's, there's, a, there's a hole in the market that, uh, that I didn't even know about, that there's this always this yeshiva kids who grew up in yeshiva, but also are looking, who are aware of the music, the secular music. Sure. And, and um, we were at the time, the only band that was really bridging that, that gap, okay. you know, I think my dad's, what's funny, my dad had done it, you know, 10, 15 years ago with Diaspora, but um, he did it in Israel, and there was nobody in New York at the time really doing that. Um, so um, we very quickly became like a touring band, and we started, um, you know, we started getting better gigs, and um, the record company had right and ready put us in a van and sent us across the country, and we just went from, around the U.S. around the U.S. and played, and played, uh, every town from here to the west coast and back again wow. and did that tour for a bunch of years in a row um 
and, uh, and studio albums in between. In between, we'd come back and we did a bunch of studio albums. How many? Um, we did as a band. I think we did about five or six studio albums. Um, me and C started a side kind of thing where we just did more acoustic. Um, C Lance Mono Solomon. So we did a couple of those as well. Okay. Um, and those ones were, you know, there was a need. For, C had put out a bunch of solo albums of him doing instrumental albums. Which, oh yeah, uh, I'm sure, talked about with him. Yeah. Um, and then people were saying, "Let's get some with singing as well." So we kind of did a similar kind of vein, more acoustic, less like the two of us. And, sure. Um, and then just, you know, as the years gone by, uh, I continued to expand in New York. I, I started, uh, I went back to playing bluegrass, which was something that I, my dad did and I grew up with it, but never really, uh, had delved into it. I always kind of liked it to listen to it, never really sure. played it. But then somehow I ended up with C actually, his daughter, uh, you know, Lark Street Music, Buzzy Lee. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. he has all kinds of mandolins. He liked one too. See for his daughter to play, and I picked right. it up, and it just sucked me right in, man. And I was like, "Wow, I love this!" And started playing for a while, and started meeting people in New York, and I played bluegrass. And before I know it, I found out there's a serious scene in New York of bluegrass musicians. I wasn't even aware of it. Yeah. Which you're probably and a big part of right now. Yeah, so we started. I started a band with some friends. We called it City Grass, <laughs> and uh, that became another career. All of a sudden, that was something I just did for fun. I just enjoyed playing it, but uh, I was, you know. Music goes sometimes, you don't know who you're going to meet and how it's going to go. Yeah. And uh, that turned into another side career of uh, became a bluegrass musician in New York City. Love and, uh, and I have a, oh, maybe I got this from my dad, but I have a, just a love for instru musical instruments. So, what, I mean, so you mentioned mandolin, I know you play guitar, but what, what instruments do you play? Um, so, I play mandolin, I play guitar, um, I play banjo, five string banjo. I picked that up a couple of years ago. And, um, Another very unique instrument that uh, I underestimated before. And I thought, oh, it's like hillbillies play. How hard can it be? <laughs> and I uh, picked it up, and it's uh, counterintuitive to every instrument I play because you got the drone okay. string on top. It's really about the right oh, so learning like the rolls. Down. And it's, I play the, it's called the Earl Scruggs <laughs> method, where you, you do a three finger roll. So you have to learn these specific order of strings that you play oak rolls. Uh -huh. and, uh, just takes a lot of hours of just doing it over and you're and over. self taught and, and I'm self taught on everything. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because there's so many courses online. So I do, I do take courses online, but you know, as you can take course online, it's not a teacher. So when you go back to it, you leave it, you come back. I also feel like they take the smallest amount of information and drag it out over like 10 things. So yeah, really make, but you can learn a lot. That being said, it's really, you know, there's no excuses anymore. Yeah. You can really, for, for very cheap, you can learn a lot. Um, and you, you just have to discipline yourself. Sure. Um, and a um, bunch of years back, I took some, I took some uh, lessons with uh, Gilad Dobreski, who's a phenomenal uh, percussionist. percussionist in Israel. Yeah. And he was in, so he was in my, our band, Sophon, for a while. No way. Yeah, yeah he was that. a percussionist for like for a couple of years before, before he moved back to Israel. And he got me really into uh, uh, drumming and general hand drumming and, and uh, chanting, even in the Sref Fatah Ali Khan, who's a Pakistani amazing sure. uh, quality yeah. singer. So um, so I kind of brought that into the music. I <laughs> use that, in, especially amazing. in full form, a lot of playing drumming and, and, and chanting, and so, uh, using your vocals not just for singing, but for creating. I feel like from as as from the outside, like um, watching your career, it's like this um, never ending journey of learning and discovery. Like you're always like, oh, here's a new instrument I found. And like, which is really that cool. I think people ask, well, what keeps you excited about music? That I think has been for me, the most exciting thing is, uh, is um, I'm eager to learn more. I want to get, right. uh, it's like, I wish it was more hours in a day sometimes. <laughs> so I, you want to give it each instrument. I wish you that every single time. day. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, if you could just like sit around for six hours and practice, you know, even within, within instruments, you know, I think for sure. there's a lot of different styles, like, uh, and get acoustic guitar, you can do the finger style, or you can do the right. strum okay. style, and you can do... I just remember when I was in um, in music school in Israel, one of the first, um, um, you know, one of the first lessons they were teaching us to play, I think it was like Eshet Chayel or something like that, and they, and they said, uh, we're going to play this in 7-8. Yeah. And I was like, can we spend like six months being really good at playing in four, you yeah. know, or like maybe like five years, you know, before. Yeah. But there is, there's, there's so much, it's yeah, an endless it's, world. Yeah, take your battles, but at the same time, you can also just, just getting a little better at everything yeah. is just, I mean, to me, it's one of the most, I get just excited now as I did when I was a kid, like learning a new lick, like just now, sure. that doesn't go away. Like when there's something new and it's me, it's like, wow. Yeah. So thank God for that. I mean, it's, a, it's such a gift that. Uh, How has, um, how do you feel like the music industry 
particularly within the Jewish world, has, has changed from back when you started to today? Um, well, I think well, it's in all the whole industry, not just music. The, the big thing that I've seen is, uh, you were talking about a little bit before, is the visual aspect of it. Mm, that sure. you, you no longer can just make a CD and people will listen to it. Um, you have to accompany it with a video, yeah. which is a lot of it's like, what? Like, that's not at all. We don't have to learn a new skill. We will have to learn how right. to do our social medias, how to get videos out there. And and most of us, you know, I mean, people out there forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. It's a new, new yeah. art. We didn't have, it's not part of music. It's a new art. But that that's one big thing. And the other thing I would say is, um, well, it's in, the, in the last couple of years, I'm finally there was. I felt the Jewish music to me felt very stagnant for a while. Like there was a, the arrangements were very similar. They all seemed to come out of like the '70s or '80s, like a lot of horns and like that. The, sure. That arrangement that was like not. I don't think originally Jewish, but became that the Jewish sound. Infiltrated. You know, the infiltrated. Um, yeah. And in the last couple of years, maybe thanks to like um, you know good, really good Israeli producers or whatever, it's suddenly like. You, you have real, like, modern war production coming into sure. Jewish music. You know, um, uh, people like, you know, Hanad ben Ari and Omar Adam. And like, I think that's also, like, as a, as a, like, a side effect of just what it's doing is that it's kind of creeping into America a little bit and people are noticing. And... Right. Also, it's more, it's more palatable for other people who maybe couldn't listen to our yeah. music sound and, and old to them. Um, well... I guess we're talking about this, and also you mentioned before um, when you when you said the, the head of the yeshivas was saying, "Don't go to soul form; it's not Jewish music." Yeah. What do you think Jewish music is? Huh. Um, wow. So that uh, is is a huge question. I think Jewish music is just uh, it has to do with the content, with with the lyrics at this point. I don't think that the music itself is it can be defined anymore as Jewish because. I mean, there's hip hop. There's literally every style and done in Jewish at this point. It's really the, the content of the lyrics. Um, what about a wordless nigger? What? What is it about that that makes it feel Jewish? Maybe the inflections of it, you know, the melody. Like I think some of the same nigunim, if they were sung like more like played on a on a synth, might not sound so Jewish. But I think I think a lot yeah. has to do with the with the with the, the inflections, the way we sing, the way we sing. Ah, 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 ah that the little, ah, right, right, little yeah, the little ah, the kvetching, the kvetching in there. Yeah. Um, and just the, the, the trills, the, vocal, the choice of vocal trills. There's R and B trills, and there's just Jewish trills, and it's just sure. that that come from maybe from Hazanas from. Um, that's a that's a very interesting know. point. I mean, a lot of Chabad Nigunim are actually, you know, they're old Russian folk songs or whatever. So it's like, what makes them Jewish is, you know, is the fact that they are now being sung by Chabad Hasidim at Fabrengen. You know, is it like the, the people who sing them? Um, I, I also think like it's a, what's interesting about this question is that everyone has a very, very different answer. And I've heard everything from, what are you talking about? There's no such thing as Jewish music to, um, to Jewish music is music that makes you feel more Jewish or more committed mm. to God, which I, I like. Um, um, but I was speaking to, um, you know, Hannah Raskin. Yeah. 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 So she, she was here. She, she has Chabad melodies a lot. Yeah. And, and so she pointed out that the answer to that question will often tell you more about the person and their connection with music and, and Jewish music than there being, you know, one answer for everyone, which is kind of why I started the podcast, because I'm, I love getting everyone's different perspectives. Yeah. I think as Jews, that's who we are, you know, and I haven't even got, I eventually want to get to Israel and, you know, I want to, there's, there's Moroccan yeah. know, Jewish music or, you know, people. From well, I, th I think, uh, come back to Nagunian specifically, like, uh, I mean, my biggest reference is obviously in Shlomo Carlos, sure. because I, I've known him my whole life and so with him. And, sure. Um, it's the first Nagunian that I really was aware of, but I, I think... His nigunim, the secret to them is that he, that first of all, that they're super easy. To, he makes them so very sure. accessible. You almost seem to feel like you know them when you sing them. But really, I think that the reason they're successful is because he wasn't going for like a clever melody. He wasn't, his his idea was just to make it so that he could, he, the goal wasn't the nigun. The goal was the teaching. Right. He did the nigun as a place to elevate your mind so you get everybody to a place. And usually, as concert, if you see him, whenever it's like the highs, everybody's like, God, and it's going right. and this thing, he would just sh and then he would teach. Like, mm -hmm. okay, you're ready. You know? Right, right. So uh, I think uh, it, that's that, you know, the purpose of a good nigun, a nigun is that. It's not, it's not it's, the nigun is not the goal. The nigun, right. The it's place, like the, the media. It's a medium to, 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 to clear your mind and, and, and you know, 
And one of the few things I learned at Chabad by Dut, like the first year I talked about that, I did the only thing I, or one of the only things that took out of there that was really uh, meaningful and stayed with me was that. Did we do like um, for different, uh, test kiss that whatever it was, we'd have a program and we'd all sit and they hear three, you know, three to 500 students singing a nigga together. The power of that and I thought that during that time, every all the troubles were like, no, it's all you are. You're thinking, so you're, right. you're in the nigun completely. So a good nigun does that. And um, mm-hmm. I don't know if Jews had cornered the market on it, but we, we know how to do that. You know, right. it's like, right, right. Uh, you know, it's similar to like, you know, Native Americans, like, when they do their chants or whatever. Sure, sure. Um, you know, to, or, it's about reaching a place. You, um, you did a Chabad album, right? I sure. did a Chabad album. Um, what, when, when and what was that? <clears throat> Um, was it with C? Is it with C? Yeah, we did. Me and C did, and it was. We had a couple of requests for it by people, and I, I kind of, to be honest, I fought it for a little while, and I said, I know all isn't going to be yes. And I grew up with them. I've been known from a very young age, sure. um, but I just, I, I had, a, like I said, I had a bad taste from this Yeshiva. Okay. I was like, I was like, uh, can we do rest up with something else. I don't, you know, I'm not, sure. I'm not connected. But um, C really leaned into me. He was like, no, nah. he's like, I'm telling you, we can make it good. And yeah. he was right. We. Uh, um, it had a slogan. We did the Chabad album. Rachmanas on there, right? Rachmanas. So we did. Yeah, yeah opens up. Um, and uh, it, at first, the album didn't. Nobody didn't make any. Then I said, "I told you, see, nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody will see any of this." Um, but it had a life of its own, and over the years, it's one of our best selling <laughs> albums. Wow, that's so crazy. It's, yeah, it's all of a sudden. It's actually interesting that it's covered later on. We're talking we're, about like um, the way things have changed in streaming. I one of the things that I kind of love about releasing music nowadays is that you can put something on Spotify and you have no idea if in five years someone will stumble right. across that album. Like it's, it, it doesn't matter if it's in the store. It might have life of its own. Somewhere. Yeah, someone might just be searching the name of that song exactly. and by the way, see yours. And then, so I think that's what's happened with about over time when it was up on, up as it was up on YouTube, so people start searching the song and I guess we pop up because, you know, there's yeah. not that many Chabad albums out. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, so it, like, it took on a life of its own. And uh, like I say, it's uh, been... That's amazing. How um, you mentioned um, knowing and, and, and playing with uh, Shlomo Kobach. What kind of time period was that for? And can you tell me a little bit more about your so relationship? So when we were moved, moved to Moshav, like I said, in uh, 75, so uh, he would just, he was, we actually got a house right ne- next to him. We became his next door neighbors. So um, um, I don't think I realized the importance of it when I was growing up. It was just like, he was a local, you know, rap. And the only thing that was cool is when Shlomo would come, I, we noticed that it would be what they call the Shlomo Shabbos. And suddenly like, like all these crazy, people. all hippies would show from ever, you know, tents being pitched all over the Moshav. And um, there was this like, it was like this, fit, like the, it felt like yeah. a circus came to town. It was like <laughs> this fair. And then in the summer, he would sometimes live there for three, four weeks at a time. Um, and he used to, I remember he always walked past my house and he'd see me sitting on the front and practicing the car and then she'd stop for a second and like, my oh, son looks like yeah, brother. Yeah. <laughs> like, always very encouraging. And then um, when I was about six, I think my first time, once, I t- I've told the story before, but uh, it's, it's a great story. I was in about, I think I was like 15 or 16. Um, I was playing in front of my house and uh, and Shlomo Sh- Sh- heard me playing again and he goes, uh, you want to play with me tonight? I have a gig. And I said, sure. <laughs> you know, I never played a gig before. Um, but uh, he, he asked me, he asked my, my dad, it's okay. And I said, sure. So I went and we went. It was me, him. It was a trumpet player from the Mushav. And, um, and a bass player and somebody playing tambourine. And it was like really like none of the, nobody could really play, including me. You know, <laughs> but uh, we went and it turns out it was at an army base. Um, for for female for for women soldiers, wow. we had a, it was two thousand women soldiers in there, okay. and they were he Shlomo with his magic somehow got him up dancing, and they were like they were dancing. So they actually at one point stormed the stage and danced like all around the stage, and I'm like hugging my little guitar. I'm oh, like, uh, I think it was like the seed of like this is what I'm gonna do. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was wild. It was wild for me also to see like talk about Nagunim, like you know like the band was not what was carrying the music, you know. Right. It was like. We were terrible. I didn't know that I was chasing, trying to watch his hands, trying to play chords, yeah. you know, and the uh, trumpet, all of us, it was, it was out. But he had a way of just transcending all that and just saying, and the England was so strong, his connection was so strong with the people. He was he was really just using it uh, as a <clears throat> way to connect with the people. Yeah. yeah. It might have helped that we all looked like, we didn't know, <laughs> we looked like freaks, you know, so we're all this. Uh, uh. 
it's funny actually he mentioned um i think at some point in in new york he yeah. decided to put together this really professional oh yes he had a random band <laughs> yeah and he and he said it was a disaster it was just like it wasn't the right vibe not just yeah but also because every time someone met anybody who you play an instrument come play with me tonight yeah. he just he didn't you know he didn't he, he was able to somehow tune all that out even though people playing out of tune and you know people can't play their instruments he was had a magic way of still making the concert a huge success. Amazing. I still, I, I meet people randomly. Um, I had someone at for Shabbat like a couple of months ago. And he was like, yeah, I played with Shama Kalbach. Everybody, and yeah. I was like, cool, what did you play? And he was like, tambourine. <laughs> He's like, that. He, he was like, I'm a tambourine player. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he made everybody feel, spe- he made him feel, everybody feel like the, like the best musician in the world also. He had that kind of gift. Like he made everybody feel great, but he also, especially with musicians, he was, he was like, Psh. <laughs> that's awesome so uh, it was very encouraging to me and like I say I, I just I, I I took him for granted a lot even when I moved to New York he used to, he used to when I first moved to New York in the, in the 90s he would call me for gigs uh, wow. right before he passed uh, I was his regular go-to bass guitar player for like every time he had a local gig and um, and I remember the last gig with him was about a month before he died he played at a place called Vegetarian Heaven in the upper west like Lincoln Center area mm-hmm. and people Eating, some people tuning in, but it was right. like it was amazing, you know. Like he was Shlomo. You know? <laughs> now you have tribute bands back in the house, right. you know. Right. Uh, he just and maybe it was overexposure, or maybe I don't know what it was, but he just like he just always just played and and stopped. And uh, but even then, he was able to always to say the right thing. He was able to tune and tune the people in. Okay. I once did a gig with him and called me, and we went. To, it was like after another gig, he said, "Can you come with me? We're going to Borough Park. We played and started like midnight." You know? bunch of chassidim sitting around he spoke only in yiddish and he had them all just like singing and dancing like you know, he, so he went from like a concert to, to that and right no seamless no, transition seamless transition for him yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's amazing how much the, the music is just so much a centerpiece of like jewish life it's, everything it's everywhere yeah. yeah no matter what you are no matter what uh conservative orthodox think about now like the 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 Anthem, you know, when there's a wall going around, people surround me so high. Like this. Yeah. It's wild. It is wild. It is wild. Um, there's nothing, uh, as someone who has, um, as someone who has siblings who I'd love to sing with, I know the joy of what that feels like. It's something that you have uh, with your brothers. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, it's the best. Well, m- as growing up, my father was uh, working actually all throughout my childhood. He, he was hired by Breslov Research Institute to put out um, Breslov music. Uh, no, no one, there was no one who had written, made songbooks and actually had documented it. It was just passed around. So he took, you know, he uh, did amazing work where he would go f- to old uh, Hasidic, old Breslov Hasidim, and it's oldest he could find, try to get him as authentic as he could to an original wow. melody. Um, within a few years of him doing it, they all passed on. So he really, he really, he really did a huge service to Breslov and he tried to be as meticulous as possible and made the songbooks and he would also put out CDs and while he was doing that he would have me and all my brothers be his choir. We would all uh, he would write out parts for us and we'd all sing. They actually um, written notation parts, so we can't read music. <laughs> <laughs> That's his own thing. Yeah. We're all self taught. He can't so he would he would he would record it as um he was a, he was very early on. He was into MIDI. Uh, so he would make okay. a very MIDI sign. <laughs> he was like, this is your part. And he was yeah. very strict with it. And we all had to learn our part by listening to the MIDI over and over. So he came in, he's like, don't waste my time. You come in, know it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, my father has a master's degree in vocal harmony from Berkeley oh, wow. College. So he's really, no, he really understands vocal and he, you know, he loved the Beach Boys. He loved, he loved anything that's like vocal arrangements he's really into. So, um, and even with the Asbury Shiva, all those crazy uh, arrangements that he, that he would write for them. So we grew up very much as a family who's very aware of harmony. Um, we get the look of someone singing out. And, you know, so <laughs> at the table, Shabbos table, whatever, everybody had their parts, you know, and you, you don't, you don't double up with harmonies, you know, right, right. like, so I grew up second nature for us to, to do that uh, without being going to school, we went to the Ben Sion Solomon mm-hmm. school. <laughs> and uh, so singing with my brothers is first, like, we all have like, we have that, when we start singing together, we all go back into that Shabbos table kind of vibe or sing. But as you know, also it is just something, um, you hear the melody in the same way. There's no different inflections that you have to correct. When you sing with someone, with a singer, you might you might fit the lyrics differently, or you might you know do the melody slightly different. When you sing with your brothers, there's something that we all we kind of read each other's read each other. Yeah, and yeah. it's like one like if I'm like I did a uh, 
gig with Huda the other night at the Carlo Show. It's like, if he drops out the melody for a second, it's like, without even thinking about it, I'm on the melody, and he, and then he comes back on harmony. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's pretty it's much telepathic, yeah. It's it's like something that, <clears throat> you, there are bands that, you know, made up of people who just meet each other, and like, yeah. you have to rehearse for years to have that, <clears throat> right. um, if it's not with people that you... And, and, with, and with my brothers, it could be like, we don't sing together for two or three years and get back together, and it's like, it's it, it will sound like we rehearsed it's all this. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, so cool. Which is what we did last week. We played a full two hour set and no one had any idea they had flown in that morning from Brooklyn <laughs> right. and we haven't played sung together. Right. You made the set list twenty minutes before. Exactly. <clears throat> Sorry, not to so, show you guys. <laughs> no, we made the set list for a couple hours. No, I'm kidding. Still um For a young aspiring musician today, what advice would you give there? Uh, well, first of all, I would say just to be extremely grateful because um, you know, it's uh Blessing or curse, whatever you look at it, it's you know when, if you have the bug and you want to be play music, it's uh, it's it's going to be a hard and it's going to be and you have to keep pushing at it. But it's it's you know it's also a beautiful life. It's like uh, you get up, it doesn't go away. If you really if you really truly like love music, it's you're going to get up every morning and you're going to be excited by it. And uh, I'm a, a you know, testament that you think other jobs that you get sick of and try to look at something else. Right. Uh, I literally get up every morning. Look at my guitar, play with someone excited to go pick it up and play oh, it, or my mandolin or whatever. So that's uh, you know the first thing. Remember that that you were lucky, that, you know that you were lucky that you know that you, this is your path in life. Um, other thing I would say is uh, keep getting better, keep practicing. Um, you know, and and be 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 specific about what you practice. So just like practicing doesn't mean noodling with your guitar for two hours holding up. It means focusing on one one thing per day. Make a little growth, even if it's a little tiny piece of growth, it's, it's huge. There's, there's big satisfaction in it. Um, like, you know, if, you, if you're playing a song and you keep playing one part, you kind of fit through it because you're not sure that she yeah. good, then take only that part That's and get that. Make that part your best part of the song. I used to sit down and yeah. practice and then practice yeah. and I was like hold on I think I'm just playing things that I know it's very really well yeah. and then I wish I learned I learned at a younger age just, that was a piece of advice that would, would have helped me and I was like don't don't keep repeating the piece just repeat that one part that's hard for you do that a million times so that's your best sure. part and it, the third thing I would say is uh, write songs because that's I think one of the most for me it's been one of the most rewarding parts of music when you have covering songs is fun and playing with other people's music is, is fun and collaborating is always fun but like really when you produce when you make something that's yours you uh, you go into a song that you wrote yourself and um and you put it out there and it's it's one of the most satisfying things in that i've done musically so wow. and it's uniquely you no one else can exactly it's something that you've done and it's going to really speak it's going to your soul will come through like you will never will with somebody else's music it's um uh, <clears throat> to touch on the first thing you said for a minute about the the gratitude that you know, this is this is yeah. your thing um it was one night last week when you were having like a jam session in here, um, you know, at night, and my wife said, do you realize how cool it is that you finish a day's work and then you're like, okay, I just want to chill out. And then you go and do exactly the same thing for another three hours. You're like, that doesn't happen with lawyers. Yeah, or, or it's the work or, and it's your release at the same time. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah. I did this very similar thing. So I played the other night, um, did a gig. And then um, I ran downtown to play. There's a bluegrass jam that um, my friend, um, they call him the Sheriff of Good Times, from Bob. Okay. And he, he just turned, he was his 85th birthday. Wow. In 85, he hosted a big jam and had all he's his friends around. <laughs> and he's like, is he? and I walked in and I was like, this is so amazing. And all your friends, he's like, this is the best birthday party I've ever won. He goes, oh. I was like, let's sit around and have some thing, of dinner at a restaurant with older relatives and right. bugging people make a toast. He goes, I don't want any of that. Goes, this is what I want. Right <laughs> so. Yeah. If you could, um, <clears throat> if you could start a band with anyone, dead or alive, Ooh. who are we picking? Okay, so it depends on what kind of band we're talking. Um, but uh, it's an everything band. It's an everything band. We play everything. They have a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. You can have backing vocalists. You can Ooh. have. Well, I'd want to have a good songwriter in a band, so definitely Bob Dylan comes to mind. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I love Andy Stanton's music. Yeah, okay. mm, you know, yeah I do. Actually. Yeah, yeah, he's on my list. Yeah. Oh, right with me yeah. on the list. So he's uh, um, one of the most phenomenal musicians, uh, especially like, his mandolin playing. Just like gets me completely lost. Like his wow. his his grasp of music and the way he can travel all around and but always be grounded and still land right on the one. You think he's like, what is he doing? Is he you know? Did he lose? He, the know, beat? he knows exactly where he, he is. knows where he is at all times, even when it doesn't seem like it. And uh, so I'd, he'd be my band. Okay. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. Um, if you know the, about the, the, truth, the truth is, I mean, some of the, the guys in Soul Farm, you know, I, I love yeah. that. Because, I was just about to say, it doesn't yeah. have to be, doesn't have to be some yeah. world famous. No, I mean, it be, and it has to do, I mean, a band is not always the best players. A band, as we know, all the top, like the Beatles, they're not, it's not always, it's, it's, the, right, it's the right people playing yeah. together. So if you have people who make you feel good, and it'll make you laugh and it make you um, not self-conscious. You know, that's that's why I wanted my band. It's right. not always the best player. Um, best players in the world don't, you know, most of them, we don't even know who they are, you know, because they don't, they didn't never had the outlet with another, with a show. Sure. And if you look at, I, I just saw you two in the, at the Sphere in Vegas. Uh, like, how was that? It was unbelievable. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah, uh, can't, it, was, it was amazing. But it, it really struck me how like individually, they're all okay. They're not great, right. you know, but together it's, it's magic. And a huge, it's, it's a huge it's investment fun. in that. Yeah. yeah. It's just because, and, and you can see that the love between them is evident, you know, like, right. like on the edge, like sure. lean on each other when they're playing and smile at each other and look at, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah it's, uh, you said that with the brothers, it's like, so that's. Uh, I also feel like with, I'm uh, just talking about like world famous musicians, uh, you know, whether, whether you're an artist or, or a session musician for an artist like that, you always wonder if, um, at a certain point, it must get like tire, tiring of doing. You know, there's hit songs that you know you have to play every single mm -hmm. night. Um, what's cool about what you do, which we didn't touch on yet, is that you're um, you also freelance, right? So you yeah. and you end up in all kinds of interesting yeah. places. So working in the living in New York and like I say, you know, raising a family in New York all these years, you realize uh, after a while that you need to be somewhat of a jack of all trades. You have to say yes to almost any gig that comes along. Um, you, you figure it out, you know, like, right. and like I said, I play a bunch of instruments, so I'm able to like, okay, I, I'm, maybe I'm not the right lead guitarist for this gig, but I can totally bring a mandolin sure. and add more like variety to the gig. So, um, and I, it's, it's become, I, I, first I did it out of necessity to like, okay, so I want to, I want to keep, you know, keep music alive, but it's really become a fun thing to jump into any mus you know, di different musicians and, and New York is is a great place for that, oh, you know, and you meet everybody, every type of musician and um, and being able to, when you play with people, you also, you're giving something, but you're also, you're also taking, you're stealing a little something that you walk away with, you're like, you know, that uh, I really liked what he did with that and that becomes part of your playing. So, um, and that was the other thing I would add for a musician is, is learn from everybody. I'm like, mm. don't, don't, don't ever get arrogant. Like, Everybody, even people who are not as good as you playing, have something to show you. Maybe they, maybe they have more stage presence. Maybe they have uh, more connection. Whatever it is, that everybody can teach something you. Something to learn, everyone. Is the, yeah, don't don't look down your nose at even people who you think are less good you know, than you. You know, sure. it's like. Um, and what <clears throat> what's coming up for now, Solomon? What's, what does the future look like? Where we headed? <laughs> um, I'm gonna keep doing what I play music, you know, uh, putting out music, writing, um, working on some new music with uh, with, with C and Soul Farm. We're putting out some new stuff now, uh, hopefully soon. We just did a little. We've been our goal has been every holiday now. We're putting a little. Uh, uh -huh. So we just we did a one Hanukkah. We just we wrote a quick song for Purim, put it out. So that's just a little fun mm -hmm. fun little challenge. Um, it's really fun to write songs songs when you have a specific thing to write for. It's much harder to write when it's like. Just write so about anything. Yeah. yeah. So anything is, you know, when you can just write about this, it's much easier. So that's a good little project. But um, I'm also, um, I'm very interested in, um, my newest interest is uh, learning about um, production. <laughs> oh, wow. So cool. I started taking, I'm taking actually an old, like, uh, online course or two and uh, working with every day with Ableton, spending time like, like, and, like I would learn an instrument like, um, learning about EQs and just some how well, to awesome. all this kind of so. Let me ask you, just in general, that seems to be a big part of, I love the <clears> idea <throat> that you're, you know, teaching yourself all these new things. Well, how do you, you, we mentioned this before, but like you really need discipline to do this properly. Like how do you stay yeah. on top of it? Um, for me, it's uh, making uh, daily schedules. I actually write down, I'll be like, night, like as if somebody hired you, you know. You do it like, the night before, the other week. Usually the night before. Night before, night before um, I'll do it and I'll say tomorrow, 9 to 12, I'm working only on on guitar or whatever. Right. I'm going to practice, you know. Um, it's the only way that's worked for me. And I have to pretend that somebody hired me and that's that's the gig, you know. Um, then you, you're, not, you're not getting paid for it, but you are. You were getting paid. Yeah, and on yeah. the big, yeah. Yeah, on the big scene. So, so I find daily schedules has been 
really almost the only thing that works for me. Because again, it's very hard to discipline yourself and especially with, and, and also put your phone away while you're doing something. If you're doing something specific, you have to put your phone away because your phone will yeah. continuously distract. I also realize like if, if you <clears throat> can't have WhatsApp on your computer, if I'm sitting there producing, yeah. And it's like, well, I need it open because when I finish the bounce, I need to send it. Because even if you ignore it, you're yeah. not really ignoring it. Part of your mind is it's like, oh, I got to get back, check yeah. that out. Getting into a state of like real creative flow is, it's impossible if you are unflexible. <clears throat> yeah. You have to, have to cut off. Yeah, you have to make it your time. And, I, and I've, I've read that a lot of like Paul Simon and there's a lot of writers who do that very much also. They're like, even if they're home, like this is, he's not home. He's, yeah, he's not, not available right and, now. Uh, and, yeah. But we also live in a blessed time that really, like I said, is you're only limited by your, you know, you, by your excuses. <laughs> it's like there's really everything is out there. Sure. It's everything. All the knowledge is available to us twenty four seven. You just have to seek it. It's not expensive. The knowledge is all there for almost free. Yeah. Um, you really just have to. You have to just discipline yourself. So love that. It, I love tips too. That's so it's worked for me and so far for the most right. part is getting daily schedules. Amazing. No, thank you. This has been really uh Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um how should about playing some music? I'd love to. It's in the studio anyway, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amen. Mm-hmm.